This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, and on behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual roundtable series. We are bringing together top thought leaders in our industry, talking about topics important to us in our monthly virtual roundtable series, available right here on JSA TV YouTube channel, as well as on JSA Radio, the only tech and telecom podcast series currently available on iHeartRadio. These monthly roundtables lead us right up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our industry networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Next one up is November 14th through the 15th, 2016 at the Montage Beverly Hills, right here in sunny Los Angeles. More information is at thetelecomexchange.com. Hope you can join us there. And today's topic, also one we're discussing in November at Telecom Exchange, network security in 2016 and beyond. And it's certainly a topic worthy of our interest. It's been gaining a lot of attention on our social media boards, as well as at many water coolers and businesses across America and globally. Um, also a hot topic right in the movie theaters with this weekend's release of the movie Snowden. So with all this excitement mounting, let's get started. Welcome to our live audience who's joining us here today. And thank you also to those who are watching on demand. This roundtable is brought to you on our JSA video platform, which allows our panelists to log in virtually from anywhere around the world. And today we are spanning the Atlantic Ocean with our speakers coming in from London as well as rural Virginia. So thank you, Pinnaca, for uh, our partners for helping us with this video feed. And let's go ahead and get started. I am honored to introduce our guest moderator, Mr. Ronald Gruya, also a friend of mine. He's the Director of Emerging Telecoms at Frost & Sullivan with 18 plus years of telecom industry expertise uh, at Frost & Sullivan as well as Nortel Networks. His expertise covers NGN transition like SDN and NFE, Telco 2.0 like Next Gen Value Added Services, as well as examining the enterprise of the future. So you see IVR apps and of course, an interest in cybersecurity, which makes him the perfect moderator for today, as well as in November at our Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtable on cybersecurity as well. And I should mention Mr. Leanne Cooperman of ZenEdge, a panelist here today, will also be joining us speaking on cybersecurity at Telecom Exchange. So this is definitely a great start of a conversation that is well worth our attention. Ron, thanks for being with us today, and please go ahead and do us the honors of introducing our expert panelists. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I wanted to uh, thank uh, uh, JSA for the uh, opportunity, and it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, we have a very talented group of uh, panelists, so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, um, in, uh, sort of just quickly introduce them and let them each uh, uh, talk a little bit about themselves and uh, their companies and what it is that they're doing. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to try to go around around the horn. So we have uh, first uh, Nick Russo, CTO of uh, uh, Host.net, uh, Leon uh, Cooperman, CTO of uh, Zenedge, and uh, Jason Cook, who is the uh, Chief Information Security Officer at uh, BT Global Services. So, gentlemen, uh, thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you. So, uh, how about if we uh, allow you each to give a brief uh, intro uh, about yourselves and uh, uh, your companies uh, as, as if, uh, what you do uh, pertaining to security in particular. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nick Russo. I'm with uh, the CTO for Host.net. We're a uh, Florida-based uh, ISP uh, data center. Uh, we have co-location uh, facilities, virtual server hosting, uh, and some managed services such as managed firewalls and business continuity services. Awesome. Hi, guys. Uh, great, to, uh, great to speak to everyone today. My name is uh, Leon Cooperman. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for ZenEdge. We're a cybersecurity firm specializing in web application security. 
Uh, we help our customers secure uh, one of the most prevalent ways of delivering applications to the world today, which is through the web. Uh, and it's uh, a growing and major concern as uh, much more of uh, the world's transactional uh, business is happening over the internet. Uh, this is a key channel for security. Um, and happy to be speaking about the uh, topics we have on deck today. Thanks, and this is Jason Cook uh, from BT. As uh, Ronald said, I'm the uh, regional CISO for BT in the Americas here. And in particular, I just want to highlight BT's experience in this space. BT has been running as a telecoms company now for 170 years, you could say. And at least uh, 70 years of that, we've been running a very efficient, effective cybersecurity and physical security practice uh, that has been as several thousand now uh, consultants and, and uh, security experts in. And we, we cover all aspects of physical and cyber security as you'd expect us to do if we're protecting our customers across 180 countries now, I believe, is the very latest statistic if you look at all of our partner links that we have. So uh, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, it's fascinating. It's great. I think we, we have a very good representation here from uh, Post.net, uh, ZenEdge, uh, which, uh, which is an uh, interesting company that does enterprise uh, class bot detection, web application firewall, etc. And uh, Jason, uh, certainly uh, BT Global Services, which uh, in security has a very uh, rich history, right? I understand uh, uh, going all, all the way back to World War II and uh, uh, as as, uh, as the uh, British forces were trying to crack the uh, Enigma machine, and uh, uh, I know you had brilliant scientists working there, like Alan Turing, etc. Uh, so it must be really. Uh, I think we, we have a, a great panel here. So uh, let's uh, let's start with uh, with the first question. I know um, it's a hot topic, uh, du jour, uh, and it's uh, often talked about a lot. Uh, the Internet of Things, and uh, I know uh, you know when people talk about uh, some of the uh, market restraints for uh, Internet of Things market to flourish, uh, the two topics that uh, are brought up, uh, you know, uh, interoperability and security. So you have so many things that are being connected uh, quickly. Uh, how, how will IoT increase the risk uh, uh, for, for cybersecurity in your view? So maybe um, let's, let's start uh, with, uh, with Jason and then uh, uh, go to Nick and uh, Leon. Certainly. Well, if you think about uh, cybersecurity in particular, um, traditionally, we, we as an industry for many, many decades, you could say, have been looking at protect the network, protect our sort of our usual assets around data centers and our key offices. And we are at a genuine inflection point now. The way technology is rapidly changing, um, there are so many devices being launched now. So the Internet of Things is, is real. It's not something that's coming. It is here. You look at anyone's shopping list, uh, buying any gadget, this technology enabled all sorts of things from clothing to healthcare items, etc. And that's just in the consumer space before you even look at industry. And unfortunately, even though there's the greatness of releasing all of that technology, which is enhancing people's lives, things are going at a pace. There's no standards whatsoever in that, in that space. A friend of mine just released a paper called The Internet of Dangerous Things, Brian Fight. And that really talks about the clash of how standards are just so behind in that space. Um, and really, we need to look at things quite differently, because if we try and approach security around the Internet of Things in the same way that traditionally we've approached security, then really we're going to be behind the curve even more so than we are now. You look at um, uh, some great examples of what I call a cluster of things that are now connected to the Internet. Uh, the connected car is a great example of that. Um, it takes, what, five plus years for a car to go from a design to actually hitting the road. And at that time, uh, just look at the last year or so, how many cars have been hacked famously, and then those brands have had to recall those cars because the last thing they were thinking about when they were excitedly releasing a cluster of Internet of Things was security. <laughs> the only company that's out there that's thought about security in that context, uh, and hats off to them, is Tesla. They've had the same issues and vulnerabilities and everything else that all the other companies that have released connected cars have come to. But Tesla have at least thought about it in the context of we need a rapid way of releasing a patch update because everyone at the end of the day is still going to be affected by some form of vulnerability. 
And so hats off to them. They've at least approached that with a, let's think about security in the future of how we're going to manage things securely in that context. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. That's, that, that was a great insight. I saw the recent uh, Tesla hack. Uh, um, um, Nick, maybe you uh, could elaborate further? Uh, sure. Yeah. And, and, I, and I totally agree, Jason. Uh, especially with Tesla, they have the ability to, uh, to push out updates to their cars in almost real time, push out updates to 150,000 cars in a matter of days uh, without having to recall the cars. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, and the sad fact about the Internet of Things is that most of the devices that are being introduced uh, <clears throat> don't have security in mind. They have their functionality as their first priority, not necessarily the, the security of the device. And with every device out there, every type of device, there's going to be some kind of vulnerability uh, it, it, uh, just inherit to the device, no matter what it is. And I'm sure the bad guys are going to find them very quickly and be able to take advantage of them. Uh, but we don't want to get into a situation where we have to pay someone a ransom to be able to drive your car or to, uh, or to use your stove or your fridge. Um, sure. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen even uh, hacks like, uh, you know, MCUs at uh, video conferencing uh, units inside some enterprises could actually be hacked and uh, people could actually see what's going on inside an enterprise or, or even in a home environment uh, like uh, baby monitors also being hacked, uh, which is, again, they're notably for not having security and so many, so many vulnerable points. Uh, okay, Leon, maybe uh, you could uh, contribute some. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think when you when you look when you if you did a query of you know chief security officers in the industry and you asked them what their number one concern um, is and what keeps them up at night, it's going to be all of these uh, devices that are connected, as Jason pointed out, not designed for security. And automotive was a great example because if you look at the automotive design, the 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 way that the devices within an, uh, a car are communicating with one another, they're built on this arcane bus system that was designed, you know, with, with, in an 8-bit environment um, many, probably 20 plus years ago. And um, that same bus was leveraged for IoT communication and uh, an internet-connected device was just placed on that bus. It's a great example, as Jason pointed out, of design coming first and, um, and a security thought coming at, at the very tail end, if, uh, if at all. So the first time I kind of saw uh, an uh, IoT attack from a web application perspective, there was a couple of very interesting ones a couple of years ago. Um, one of the things you have to realize about the design of these devices, the cheapest and fastest way to get an IoT device to market is to take a standard Linux distribution uh, and put it out there uh, and, and put, a, put a wrapper around it and all of a sudden you've got mini Linux machines running your drop cams, or not drop cams, but your video cameras. Uh, you've got them running your refrigerator, uh, IoT capabilities, and so forth. Well, the problem with that is it's, uh, if you're not thinking about it from a security perspective, it's an extremely vulnerable environment. So we had situations where refrigerators were spent sending spam email, and a botnet of a specific type of refrigerator was collected by attackers to send spam. The same thing is true from a denial of service perspective. Think about when you, uh, a DDoS attack, a distributed denial of service is essentially a set of users, uh, a bot connecting to a web app, website or a network. Well, how amplified is that when you're talking about not tens of millions or hundreds of millions, but billions of devices? It's almost overwhelming. So we really have to get a handle on this. And uh, Ron, to your point, um, we can't necessarily solve this with uh, pure human analysis. There has to be a, a bigger overarching theme here. And, and I'm sure we're going to get into some of the solutions as we talk to it with the rest of the panel. But it's, it's a very significant uh, problem that's approaching, you know, kind of epidemic scale as these devices come online. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. Uh, so let's, uh, let's stay uh, with you. Uh, let's start with you for the next one. Uh, so uh, I guess my, my next question will be uh, talking about, uh, you know, 
what what are what are some of the uh, threats that you see coming in the months ahead, uh, or perhaps further down the road, years ahead? Uh, you know, what are some of the trends or the things that you're seeing? Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, from our own perspective, we have seen uh, actually last year uh, was the uh, was the year of the uh, hacks of uh, healthcare industry, and I know healthcare industry has. Uh, all those compliance things like HIPAA, and despite that, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, hacks that happened last year, and uh, there's uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, value that's being placed on personal health records, uh, even more so than than uh, uh, financial, it seems. So uh, maybe with that, uh, we'll start with you, uh, Leon. Just what, what are what are some of the things that you're seeing, and then. Uh, we'll go with uh, Jason and then finish with uh, with Nick. Well, what are what are what some of the sort of short term and uh, longer longer term uh, threats? Yeah, it's a it's a great question, Ron. So I, I think there's kind of a, a, a duality of, of threats that we're seeing. First, uh, from a human element perspective, the phishing attempts and social engineering attempts that are being designed by really professional uh, hackers have become much more sophisticated. So Ron, to your point, when uh, a criminal organization gets hold of those healthcare records, what does it really give them? I mean, you can't really trade off of somebody's uh, of health status, essentially, but it does give them an amazing correlation into an individual. And if you're trying to steal somebody's identity, there's nothing better than understanding a health history and the set of providers that an individual uses and uh, the payment methods that they use and so forth to um, get into their social life, if you will. Um, so from a, from a social engineering perspective, this is a grave threat. Uh, and, and more so, it's, it's more acute because the level of attack and sophistication is increasing much faster than social awareness of these types of attacks. So we as a society are completely um, numb to the fact that we need to have basic security standards in our home and uh, in our personal lives. And, that basic awareness is just not there, and we have a we have a challenge to educate our societies. Um, the second real threat we see is more from more of a technical perspective. The malware and rootkits are becoming extremely sophisticated, and we just analyzed one very interesting instance um, through a honeypot where the malware and the rootkit in this particular case understood in which environment it was running and was capable of camouflaging itself. So when you tried to run it in a rootkit exploit um, lab environment, it would stop working. It would say, oh, I know someone is trying to inspect me. I am hands off at the moment. But then when it got into a real PC or in a real environment, it would you know, come right back online. So this dynamic, intelligent nature of malware is increasing and it's complex to to battle. So there's kind of a duality of threats that we see, uh, both on the social engineering and on the technical front side, as attackers get more sophisticated. Um, I'd love to hear the, the, the Nick's and, and Jason's thoughts on those. Yeah, I mean, on, on that one, I, I absolutely agree. What Leon started to touch on a point. Uh, BT and KPG just released a report. It's meant to be a bit of a teaser, really, to, 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 to think about things differently. We use the phrase, rethink the risk. Um, in all the conversations I have with, with anyone around security, very few people are actually thinking about who is the enemy? How are they acting? How are they behaving? What are they looking at? And what you find is if you look in there, especially in the cyber criminal world, which is where a lot of um, all of the attack uh, uh, is coming from, that the collaboration that they have in that in that in that space is, is pretty good. If only organisations and, and and cultures and countries and others could collaborate to the way that the cyber criminals are collaborating, we we would actually be on, on step with them, or in fact a step ahead of them, rather than in catch up mode, as Liam was intimating there. And if you think genuinely about that inflection point that we now have in the context of of um, technology, you know, we talked about the car there. But just think about the healthcare space with the amount of phenomenal devices that are coming out that are embedded into people now that can help monitor people so you don't have to be living on, on in some sort of ICU, but you can live a, a level of life outside of a hospital. <clears throat> and that's wonderful. But at the same time, no one is really looking at how to secure it. And so the threat, the threat landscape in that context has gone up. So, you know, at the moment, you may have a ransomware about your records, but you know, so certainly in the very not too distant future, you're going to have ransomware about, hey, I'm going to turn your hearing aid off. 
I'm going to switch off some other device like a pacemaker in your body, etc. And you know the technology there is there already. It's 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 how it can be used, and then unfortunately how it can be exploited. So I think we're going to see as well that the, the even though the threat um, surface is changing radically because of this type of technology coming in, the way that the attacks are happening are pretty much the same. Uh, approaches that we're seeing already, but just to a far more level of collaborated control and focus and sophistication from the, the, the criminal, uh, cyber criminals in this context. That's a great point on collaboration, Jason. I don't, if these guys have ever been in a in a black hat uh, a chat channel, essentially, um, they are highly communicative and globally distributed and well educated. Um, I have to say, so you're absolutely right. And they don't have the challenge of, of law boundaries uh, with different countries and how they operate and how they trade on information or anything else. There, they, you know, they, they're single-mindedly focused in, in, in leveraging anyone that's vulnerable in that space. Just that's great. Uh, Q and uh, Well, and if we if we actually look at the last like 20 years worth of, uh, of hacking and uh, insecurity. The challenges are, have, have really been the same. We still have, we've always had social engineering, insider threats, uh, weak passwords, vulnerabilities in the operating systems and the applications, uh, exposed ports and whatever else. I mean, those, are, those threats have always been there. And they're, but the, ch the challenge now is that, as we've mentioned, with the Internet of Things, uh, is that there's just a lot more devices and the attacks are becoming much more sophisticated than they were before, making them much harder to detect and much harder to block. Um, so, I mean, other than that, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, I agree with Leon and Jason that uh, the, uh, the, the threats that are out there now are, uh, are just so sophisticated that I don't think our traditional tools <clears throat> that we're using are going to be able to detect and block these uh, these threats. Yeah. I think that's a great that's a great point on on traditional tooling. One of the key issues there that we see is really the use of encryption and strong encryption by by hackers. Um, you know, uh, uh, PGP and HTTPS TLS are very good for privacy of individuals. Um, but when attackers are using those same shields to prevent uh, defense, this is this is a great example, Nick, to your point of uh, the sophistication and the where we're lacking in some areas, and and, and the balance between privacy uh, privacy and security. Uh, Ron, just uh, just one uh, um, uh, one point that Jason made on collaboration. Uh, great example from yesterday. Our friend Brian Krebs was. Uh, Attacked with uh, his site was attacked with the largest malware service attack that the internet ever, has ever seen, over 600 gigabits per second. And that was not an individual attacker because we know that any individual kind of group out there has less than that kind of capacity. That was a clear example of Brian upsetting uh, that community significantly enough that they all got together and they called collaborated attack after they got out of jail, of course, on bail. But um, the, it, it, that was a, a great example, uh, to Jason's point, of significant co collaborative efforts. Yeah, that's what you're going to see in that context, is you're going to see businesses, I mean, you're already seeing announcements by different governments. The UK government has made some announcements just recently about being far more proactive in taking what they call a more offensive posture. Um, in cybersecurity, investing a lot more around the intelligence and the analytics around this and how they monitor so they can essentially go upstream, as it were, to, to kind of proactively defend um, on, on a tax hit. And, and if you're seeing that um, coming from government and from large organizations, uh, enterprises working on that one, then you're going to see, obviously, a, a shift in how um, the, the cyber warfare is going to happen here, out there, most certainly. And, and another thing is that I think a lot of people just don't care. They don't care about security because security and convenience are are really uh, inversely inversely proportional. Uh, so people just aren't taking the care. They're not getting educated, and I think a great deal of the threats out there 
are social engineering attacks, uh, including the, uh, the everyday ransomware that, that we're seeing. Uh, they're just people that are getting tricked into clicking links or downloading applications uh, and installing malware on their computers. Yeah. I think this is a great segue to uh, to my next question. I think we have time maybe for a couple more, so I'll ask this one and then one uh, to conclude. But uh, uh, since you already talked a little bit about social engineering, and uh, uh, I, I was thinking about the human element as sometimes being the weakest uh, link. So I was thinking back in the uh, mid-'80s, there was that book by Clifford Stowe called The Cuckoo's Eye that was talking about the famous uh, Hanover hacker and uh, how some of those uh, Unix uh, sysops were just never using, never changing the default password from the Unix systems. And, uh, you know, hackers, uh, you know, the Hanover hacker was not really a very sophisticated hacker, and he was able to get access to sites like uh, White, uh, White Sands Missile Range, uh, which was on Millinet, uh, and the sysop there forgot, uh, you know, to change the default Unix password from uh, Mr. Roots. Uh, allowing, you know, the Hanover hacker to get in there. So, uh, you know, and then you say, well, but that's wrong, that's from the mid-80s, you know, and, and I was just thinking more recently, you know, the Lucifer hacker, the Romanian hacker that hacked into uh, so many systems, he was also not uh, very sophisticated and, uh, you know, so that's proof that this is still working. And then, of course, on top of that, you throw in social engineering and uh, uh, our uh, famous uh, celeb uh, in their celeb hacker was uh, Kevin Mitnick, who relied a lot on that technique. Uh, so, so what do you think? Is that how can we uh, uh, some good hygiene there? Um, maybe uh, I'll start with you, Nick, and then uh, go, uh, go to uh, Leon and Jason. Uh, Ron, uh, as far as the human element goes, I, I think education is going to be number one. People have to know uh, when they're being tricked. And uh, you mentioned Kevin Mitnick. Uh, I know that he has a company called Know Before that specializes in training uh, users and, <clears throat> and also doing uh, periodic penetration testing to make sure that these people are not getting tricked into uh, downloading or going to malicious links. Um, so that's it's really. I think that's really all you can do when it comes to the human element, but any good security is going to be multi-layered, and we've known that for centuries. Uh, so uh, protect your users, of course, you're going to have your anti-spam, uh, you're going to have your web filtering, you're going to have your prevention systems, your antivirus systems, your uh, you make sure your computers are patched, uh, your, your applications and data is backed up that your and IP reputation and so forth, DDoS attack prevention, those are all part of a complete uh, <clears throat> security solution. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, let's uh, let's go uh, let's go with uh, Leon and then uh, Jason. Sure. Yeah, I, I, Nick, you're 100 percent on that education is, is kind of education and awareness of so understanding how to communicate. I'm personally a, a very big advocate of trying to figure out how we can get the world to start using encrypted email with uh, verified identities and signatures. It, I mean, if you look at the average person, I mean, I bet you encrypted email has less than a half a percent penetration in the world. And, um, you know, all of this critical communication that we're doing is just basically out in the wild uh, for most for, for most attackers to intercept. It's a very weak spot for us. And, and one of the things that I think uh, the telcos uh, and larger ISPs such as BT have a real challenge is that they're managing so many uh, network uh, devices uh, uh, in their field, in their homes, essentially, for home service. Those home users are probably the most vulnerable because they just don't have the background, they don't have the, the capabilities, they don't have the, the want and need to protect themselves, right? So the, the telco industries, uh, really has uh, uh, is going to be helping us lead that battle uh, in helping not only with education and awareness but also providing some tooling for um, for the home user because let's face it all of these IoT devices where are they going there uh, other than uh, in industry where there's going to be uh, capability and budget to protect those devices they're going they're coming in the home and, and that's why you see home hacking 
for uh, for cameras and many other types of devices. So, um, okay, uh, Jason, uh, maybe you could uh, say something about the human element. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I think actually, if you look across the industry and just look across the world, really, uh, I think we're taking a step backwards. Uh, there's a couple of generations of, of, of younger folks now that are so much more comfortable using technology, changing their devices, hopping around from one account to another. Uh, and the way that they share their information is so different perhaps to the other generations that we've got that I actually believe we're taking a step backwards in that context. Uh, people saying, oh, what happened to me? Or, or on one level, not really caring about what they share or having you know, the, 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 the sort of sensitive calibration there to understand what they share and the impact of what they could share that could impact their personal life. So I do believe we're all, we've got a step backwards there that needs to be addressed. And I think that's as a result of the things that you will see from communication companies like BT is that duty of care that we want to step up in then um, uh, providing more protection in the services that we've got to, to essentially balance that out. Not only that, but also if you were to come to one of BT's labs, um, you'll see quite a lot of sophisticated uh, cyber companies working with BT in finding ways of trying to acknowledge that, I wouldn't say naivety, but that lack of appreciation around personal security that people have, and trying to find ways of, as a result, stepping up the level of protection that we can provide for people in the services that we've got. So you're absolutely going to see that um, from like BT. And it's funny as well, if you think of the human element, um, BT launched all a while ago now, and it's a very busy practice for us, and ethical hacking for connected cars, which is why I mentioned it. Very much a cyber-focused uh, practice, but we still have an ethical hacking pen testing uh, practice where we actually send people physically into meetings that customers have or buildings that they have, and you'll be absolutely amazed, even for companies that you've recognized their brands, where you think, oh, they've got a level of security at the physical layer. And when that convergence of physical and cyber has come in, at the moment, so many organizations have not addressed that gap. And as a result, literally let people walk in still to exploit that, hence the Micnick comments and others, which, which are so, so relevant. And what we're finding is that sometimes it's a real slap in the face to, to wake people up to, hey, we just had someone walk in and pick up some very sensitive material information from your organization that that wake up. Uh, that, that, and even then they've had that wake up, as time moves on, they still have to address that. So we're still on that, on that edge of what is going to happen and how are people going to address this type of gap in, 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 the, in the cyber and physical security space going forward. Because I think the traditional ways that we're approaching it are still not going to be satisfactory to yeah. relying on new technology and other things to address that going forward. Okay, great. Uh, I think uh, we're uh, coming close to the top of the hour, so we're gonna, uh, ask a, I'm going to ask a final question. If I could please ask you to uh, just uh, keep it a little bit short. I know it was a very entertaining uh, chat. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed it. But uh, uh, maybe, uh, Jason, I'll stay with you and then uh, go to Nick and Leon. Uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, know what, what do you see as the uh, future of cyber uh, protection? Um, if you think a little bit more futuristically, like three to five years out. So maybe if you could uh, please uh, keep your answers succinct uh, so we could uh, um, go around the horn. Thank you. Uh, Jason, start with you. So I think you're going to see quite quickly, actually, um, at the board level for many enterprise organizations, someone very specifically labeled with the security remit. You're already seeing that emerge in a number of larger organizations. And that's specifically top down to drive security in a far more controlled way, because organizationally, you need all the people, all the processes, and the technology to be leveraged together. And the other area that I mentioned earlier was uh, if you look at organizations today, they're going to take more of a proactive business approach, taking almost an offensive approach to cybersecurity there. That really means that they're going to lift their game in leveraging technology and intelligence gathering, in leveraging analytics and the big data space that, uh, that sits behind that, as well as also really lifting the, the, to the level of monitoring that they're able to do. And especially as you see the convergence with physical and cyber security coming together, that's actually going to be a disruptive play in actually defending against many of the cyber security attacks that we see coming up. 
Okay. Uh, great. Okay, uh, Nick. Uh, maybe we could go. Uh, we could go to uh, and finish with Leon. Uh, I, actually, I will say that the future. Uh, I, I don't think that the the tools that we have now uh, are going to really be relevant in the future or as relevant. We're not. We can't rely on the traditional antivirus software that we've been using. Uh, I think we've got to take the human elements out of it as much as possible uh, and design security solutions that um, don't depend so much on the person being tricked. Um, and, and again, going with a multi-layered approach, we're going to have to put in as many layers as possible, covering every entry point into the network, into the home, into, into every device that we can. Uh, rely more on encryption, two-factor authentication, prove that people are who they say they are, uh, uh, and uh, you know, just, just generally uh, just be more aware and more educated of what is happening in the world with, um, with cybersecurity. Uh, the things that we can do right away is Make sure that we're not using the same passwords over and over again. Uh, use a password manager like uh, like LastPass, uh, so that if someone does get your password, they don't have the password for everything that you've ever logged into. Right. Okay. Great. Uh, okay, Leon. Yeah, I, I think Nick makes a great point. Removing human element out of cyber security defense is going to be a critical factor in the next several years. We see that trend significantly increasing. Uh, there are a lot of firms like ours that are applying machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, so that uh, we don't have to do all the time and kind of think at a higher level of thought. And Jason makes a great point on physical security. Um, if you look at uh, how easy it is to walk into anyone's office and plug in a USB stick into any computer and have autorun.inf just launch your malware for you, I mean, that physical element, that barrier needs to be created. So we have to think holistically about it. And I think that is happening in the industry. We are overwhelmed right now, but I think that the tide will change and the economics uh, will be such that, um, you know, the good guy has to win in the end and, and we're on the right side of the equation. Excellent, thank you. Okay, Jamie, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been very, very entertaining uh, uh, and I learned a lot. And thank you, Ron, for moderating our roundtable on network security. Thank you to our esteemed panelists, Mr. Jason Cook, BT Global Services, Nick Russo of Host.net, and Leon Cooperman of ZenEdge. Thank you, gentlemen, for your thoughtful insights on the security challenges and opportunities that lay before us. Ron and Leon, we also look forward to hearing you live shortly at the CEO Roundtables on Cybersecurity at Telecom Exchange LA. November 15th at the Montage Beverly Hills. Thank you audience for joining us. If you want to see this and other monthly virtual roundtables on demand, go ahead and check us out both virtually and at Telecom Exchange. So that's jamiescotto.com or thetelecomexchange.com. And if you'd like your C-level to be featured right here next time, go ahead and email us pr at jamiescotto.com. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. Until next time, happy networking.